Okay, we're starting the fourth week of the semester. I think it's time to step out of the warm comfort of one dimension and look at motion in a plane. So one of the most obvious examples would be a baseball struck from a baseball bat. This diagram is showing us the velocity vector at time zero. And we already know now from our previous discussion that the instantaneous velocity vector is always tangent to the trajectory. So trajectory is the word for the actual path traced out by an object in space. And we see that the velocity vector is tangent to that trajectory. Uh, they're giving us an angle theta here. That's the angle that the velocity vector makes with the horizontal. And you can see that they have resolved the vector into components. Now, I like to do it the reverse with the, the dashes. I like to make the actual vector bold. And I put the components dashed. And they've done the reverse here. I just pulled this graphic off, off the web. And also notice that typically when I draw a vector that's been resolved into components, I make a triangle. But what they've done is they's, they've taken the vertical component and scooted it over here. But remember, vectors are a movable aroundable, scootable overable. What's with these people in the background? I just noticed that. OK, so here's the baseball at some arbitrary point along the trajectory, and I'm showing you that there's a, an acceleration vector straight down. We call that the gravitational acceleration. Really, it's towards the center of the Earth, but we think of that as being straight down. And what's the length of this vector? In SI units, it would be 9.8 meters per second per second. OK, so this may see, seem a little um, poorly motivated at first, but hopefully you'll see why I'm doing it this way. Let's choose some randomly oriented axes. The y-axis is going off in this direction. Here's the x-axis. And since we already know how to resolve a vector into components along any two axes, let's do that now with the gravity vector. This would be the component of the g-vector that's parallel to the x-axis. This is the component parallel to the y-axis, or anti-parallel in this case, because it points in the negative y-direction. And like I was saying just a moment ago, we, I could have drawn this component right here. It doesn't matter really where you draw it as long as it's got the appropriate length and direction. And for the purpose of this diagram, how about I, I label this interior angle? I will call it phi. And now that I've got that angle and I have a right triangle, I can do some trigonometry. Evidently, this is the adjacent side, so I could call that g cos phi. Now, I'm calling that the x component of acceleration because I forgot to mention, the motion that we're looking at here, we're going to pretend that it's true free fall motion. Now, normally when you hear free fall, you think of something falling straight down. But often in mechanics, we just use the phrase free fall for something moving under the influence of one force alone, that force being gravity. So we'll make the uh, unrealistic assumption that there's no air drag whatsoever on this baseball. And there's no little uh, bugs smashing into the baseball as it uh, plows through the air, because those would exert a force as well. So the only force here would be gravity. And in that case, the acceleration is the gravitational acceleration, 9.8. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, isn't it only 9.8 if you're falling straight down? No. Nope. That's one of the things we're going to look at in this chapter. Even if you're moving in a parabolic trajectory uh, or an elliptical trajectory, which is something we won't really talk about until chapter 13 or towards the end of the semester, the magnitude of the acceleration is, is still 9.8, provided that you're near the surface of the Earth, even if you're not falling straight down. So that may seem, that, that should seem kind of puzzling to you at this point. Nevertheless, it is the acceleration. And I gave it a plus sign for the x component because it's pointing along the positive x-axis. This component is in the negative y direction, hence the minus sign. And you'll notice that this component is opposite phi, which is why I went with g sine phi. G is the length of this hypotenuse here. Now, why did I do this? Oh, yeah, just to make this easier to look at. How about we rotate the whole picture so that my arbitrarily chosen axes are now horizontal and vertical in your field of view. And uh, you'll notice that they whoever made this diagram resolved the velocity vector into components along two different axes. See, they've got this axis which is actually the axis parallel to the ground, and then the axis that would actually be uh, vertical 
in this physical scenario. I've chosen different axes, so let me get rid of these components. And now I will superimpose my coordinate system down here. So I'm really going to place the origin here. Originally, I just drew the X and Y axes up here to make it easier to visualize the components, but I really want to set up my coordinate system this way. So this is the origin. This point where the ball leaves the bat has coordinates 0, 0. See that? It's at the origin of my axes. And now I can take the velocity vector and resolve it into components not along the ground and the true vertical, but along the y and x axes that I've chosen for this diagram. So you notice that the components have changed. The vector hasn't changed, but the components have changed. If I back up a couple slides, this is the x and y component in the, um, the more natural coordinate system of x-axis being parallel to the ground, y-axis being perpendicular. Uh, the vector is not going to change, but you see how the components change when I rotate my axes. My component, x component. Now, again, if I, if I write this letter without the arrow symbol, technically I'm referring to the length of the vector. Anytime you see a subscript y or x next to the label for a vector, you are definitely talking about the components of a vector. And a number such as that can be positive or negative. Case in point over here, this component is negative, right? Negative 9.8 times the sine of whatever phi is. So I want to emphasize that, that point. It's okay for numbers with subscript y or x to be negative numbers because they are components of a vector. But a number like g, which is the, the magnitude of the vector, that will always be positive or zero. So let's now uh, describe the motion of this, this baseball. Most of the work has been done for us already. We've already done the work in the previous chapters. Why am I using this equation? This is the equation for the position at any time for something moving with constant acceleration. In the previous chapters, we focused on motion along a single axis, but there was nothing, there was no restriction on what that axis could be. It, you know, pick any direction in space and you can analyze motion along that direction using this equation provided that the acceleration along that axis is constant. That's, that's really the only requirement for using this equation. So I am simultaneously applying the kinematic equation for, for position along this axis, that's the top equation, and this axis, I should really say this axis, simultaneously. And, and for that reason, we now have to introduce some extra subscripts. Before, I would just say 1 half at squared. Now I have to emphasize a sub x t squared. It's really the x component of the acceleration. Now, remember, we can only use this equation for constant acceleration. The idea is the gravity vector is a constant vector. It doesn't matter whether the baseball is, is uh, 20 feet off the ground or one foot off the ground. The, the gravity vector still points, still points towards the center of the Earth and it's got a magnitude of 9.8. And if, if the hypotenuse is constant, then the components will be constant as well. That's how I am able to make the assumption that the components of the acceleration are constant. Hence, it's okay to use these equations. You'll also notice the subscripts next to the velocities. Velocity is a vector. When I want to talk about kinematics along the x-axis, I have to talk specifically about the velocity the initial velocity along the x-axis. So this number right here is really the x component of the initial velocity vector. So from now on, when we do these uh, problems in the plane, we really have to be, we've got to use this extra notation. We have to introduce these subscripts. Well, the, the question may occur to you, can we really do this? Uh, does this actually work? Suppose uh, once a baseball, like maybe you could pull up a, a video of somebody hitting a, a home run. And you could watch it in slow-mo from the side. Suppose you could measure the initial velocity components at the beginning of the video. And using trigonometry, you could calculate the component of gravity along each axis. Could you plug those numbers in, the initial velocity vector components and the components of acceleration? Could you plug those numbers in and correctly predict the location of the baseball at all future times? until it hits the ground, of course. Once the ball hits the ground, it's now accelerating in a different way because you've introduced other forces besides gravity. Now you've got the force between the ball and the ground. But during the free fall motion, 
ignoring air drag, um, do these equations accurately predict the motion of a ball? Well, let's explore that. What have I done here? Okay, I rotated the picture back so that the, the ground really is horizontal, but I still have the, the same awkward choice of axes. And now watch very carefully what happens to the components of G. It, we don't really care so much about the components of velocity right now, but watch what happens to the components of G along the X and Y axes as I begin to rotate these axes back towards the traditional choice. So let's go ahead one slide here. Did you see what happened? Let me go back and forth just a little bit. Um, a sub x has a given length. And notice, a sub x is like the projection of the g vector onto the x-axis. What do we mean by projection? Well, imagine you had, let's say it was dark, and you had a flashlight, and you were shining your flashlight at this vector. That vector would cast a shadow, and the length of that uh, shadow is equal to the length of that component. That's kind of what people mean by projection. Watch what happens to the projection of a sub x as I rotate my axes. See how that projection got shorter? The original vector g did not change at all. It's the same length that it was in the previous slide. See that? But the components are changing. Anytime you rotate your axes, the components of a given vector along those axes will change. Let me go a little further. See how I've rotated it back towards x being horizontal? Let me go a little further. Now a sub x got even shorter, and you'll notice that a sub y is getting longer. I'll show you that one more time. Notice how a sub y gets a little bit longer each time. a sub x gets a little bit shorter. And I think you may see where this is headed. Why don't I just close this angle up altogether? In other words, put the x-axis uh, precisely horizontal. And then we see that this angle is going to close to zero, and this angle, which I called phi, will actually open up to 90. And there it is. And what just happened to the x component? It went to zero. So once again, let me go back, watch what happens to a sub x as I tilt the x-axis towards the horizontal. a sub x gets shorter, shorter, and then it's just gone. Another way to see that uh, keeping in mind that phi here is 90, we go back up to the expressions that I wrote down using trigonometry. What is the cosine of 90? You should have that memorized. It's 0. So yes, the A sub X component should be 0. So what, this is kind of a circuitous way of arriving at this, this conclusion. Most, most of the time, the books will just start with this picture. But I, I like to emphasize that you could use the constant acceleration kinematics to analyze the motion of something like a baseball using any uh, set of orthogonal axes, x and y. But there's one particular choice of axes that makes the most sense. Why does it make the most sense? Because you have eliminated this term from the x equation. If the component of gravity along your chosen x-axis is zero, then you don't even have to worry about that term, the one-half at squared term. Just get rid of it and then your equations become simpler. Also, you'll notice, what is the y component of g? It's just g. The full g vector is along the y-axis, so that component's easy. It's just 9.8 with the minus sign, of course. You can also see that just by using the equation. Remember, it was negative g sine phi. Plug in 90 degrees for phi. Sine of 90 is 1, so the equations also tell us what the components are. Great. So. We've, we've made this problem simpler. We've gotten rid of this term, and in the y equation, the y acceleration is just g with a plus or minus sign, depending on the direction of your y-axis, you know, whether it's up or down. Okay, so here are uh, our slightly more convenient equations, or significantly more convenient, really. And what am I trying to indicate here? Okay, well, um, the way this picture is constructed, you have to imagine that a snapshot of the baseball was taking, taken at equal time intervals. Maybe it's every second, although that's a long time for a ball to be in the air. Let's say half a second. So every half a second, you take a picture with this camera, and you'll notice that during the first half second, the ball has moved a greater distance than it moves during the next half second. And then it moves even less distance. See the arc length here? Then it starts to move greater distances again. Well, we know that um, speed is total distance over time. 
That would really be average speed. So I'm speaking loosely here. So evidently the speed of the ball on its way up is decreasing. You know, it, it covers more distance during the first half second than it does during the next half second. That means the speed is decreasing. And then on the way down, the speed is increasing because you can see that for each given half second, more arc length is traversed. And that's what we expect. When we throw something up into the air, we generally expect it to slow down on the way up and speed up on the way down. But there's some other information contained within this diagram here. Yes, the arc length here is longer than the arc length here. That's the arc length along the trajectory. But look at the distance between the shadows at each successive moment here. If it was high noon when this, uh, this uh, situation happened, if the sun was directly overhead, you can imagine that it would cast the shadow, or the baseball would cast a shadow directly beneath it. And so if we're taking a picture every half second, we observe that the shadow of the ball moves equal distances in equal times. The ball may be um, traveling through a different actual arc length each half second, but the shadow is moving through the same distance. And what we're really talking about is the X component of velocity. See how the initial velocity vector has been resolved into components? This will be more clear in a future slide, but while the speed of the ball may be changing, the X component of its velocity appears to be constant. Now, can we confirm that with the equations? Well, let's go back to the equation that describes X coordinate versus time. If we would like to know the X velocity as a function of time, all we have to do is take the derivative, right? V is dx dt, or I should say V sub x, the x velocity, is dx dt. So after taking the derivative, well, we have to do that in our heads here. This is a constant, right? So its derivative is zero, and the derivative of t with respect to t is one, leaving us with the coefficient out front. So yes, the velocity at all times, and you know what, I goofed here, this should say V sub x. This should be the x component of velocity. It is, in fact, a constant. Remember, this is the velocity in the x-direction at time zero. So it's not changing. Great. So the, these two results are consistent. Now, I just threw this diagram up. There's no reason you should really believe that that's the way it works. But uh, maybe you can get your hands on an actual video of a baseball um, casting a shadow, and you can look at the speed of the shadow. Maybe you can go to the park at noon. Can you go to the park right now, or is that still forbidden because of lockdown? Or you can find some other demo. So let's let's do that right now. Here is the very popular Walter Lewin, or is it Levin? I'm not totally sure how to pronounce his last name. He's retired now, but you can find dozens of just perfect uh, lectures that he's recorded on YouTube. And he's he's famous not only for his teaching style, but his uh, his renowned skill with the chalk. He's able to draw these dotted lines with the chalk like nobody's business. And he's got what, like six different chalkboards behind him. So here's the golf ball. I'm going to fire the gun now. Close. Close. Reasonably close. Well, since it's only reasonably close, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I don't get the joke either. Perhaps it would help if we give it a little bit of leeway. There goes the gun. Here comes the ball. And this is just in case. Take it down. So as I'm going to push this now, give it a push. The gun will be triggered when the middle of the car is here. You've seen how high that ball goes, so that ball will go. And depending upon how hard I push it, they may meet here or they may meet there. You ready for this? You ready? I'm ready. Physics works. Yay! Sorry about the poor resolution there. That's the best I could do. Now, if you want to connect what you just saw to this diagram here, 
uh, let's see here. When, the, when that ball was launched from the cart, it was launched straight upwards, but the ball already had some horizontal velocity because it was already rolling with the cart. So you can think of this as the net uh, velocity of the ball at the moment it was launched, and the, con the cart continues on at the same rate. It just kept rolling at the same speed. But once the ball had left, even though it was launched in this direction, the only acceleration of the ball is straight down due to gravity. So there's no reason that that horizontal component of the ball's velocity should change. And you can see that it didn't because it eventually rejoined with the cart over here. So again, if this is half second between uh, pictures, then the launched ball continues to move sideways the same distance that the cart does each half second. Its horizontal velocity does not change once it's been launched. It's only the vertical velocity that changes because only in the vertical direction is there an acceleration. Let's see if we can further convince ourselves that this is the way gravity works. This is how things move within a uniform gravitational field by analyzing something in Tracker. So in the file menu, you can op open up what's called the library browser. Where is the library browser? Hmm. Okay, I had to close out Tracker and reopen it. I'm telling you, if you get a bug with that program, that's the best thing. Just put it to sleep and start over. File, open library browser. And I'm sorry, I suspect that you can't actually see this window because it's not highlighted in green. I don't think Zoom is showing this to you, but I go to, there's a, a window open called the library browser now. I go to file, uh, collections actually, collections, tracker home library, tracker sampler, and then there's a menu for mechanics. You know what, how about I just show you my entire screen? Hang on a second here. Okay. I try to avoid sharing the screen just for privacy reasons. I don't want you guys knowing what the music I listen to. But in this case, it's necessary. So I opened up the library browser. Under collections, you can go to tracker home li library, tracker sampler, and there's a bunch of preloaded content that you can have fun with. Under mechanics, free fall. I don't want the actual tracker file. I just want the video file. So I'll double click here and it immediately loads. Let's watch the video. Okay, somebody tossing a ping pong ball. That's kind of cool. Let me just grab the frames I'm interested in. Okay, so the ball has left the person's hand, and I'll stop before he's before the ball leaves the uh, the frame. Well, I guess all the way over is fine. Okay. Now, <clears throat> for the purposes of this discussion, I don't really care about the computer knowing what the sense of uh, time scale is or distance scale. But I would like to make sure that the, one of the axes is aligned with this meter stick here because we can be confident that the meter stick is vertical. In other words, gravity, I want one of my axes to be parallel to gravity so that we're, uh, we can relate that, relate that to the discussion in the previous slides. I will create a point mass. And now it's time to auto track. So if I hold down control shift, I get that little circle. Let me zoom in just a bit and make some adjustments to the template and the search window. Now I know the ball's moving to the right. It could be moving up, it could be moving down depending on what part of the trajectory it's in. So I can't do this or this. I gotta leave some room on top and bottom. And I know from experience, because I've, I've used this video before, when this ping pong ball crosses the meter stick here, Sometimes the, uh, the computer has some trouble grabbing the pixels. So instead of having a, a black background, what if I just grab those white pixels? Oops. Hopefully this template will work so I don't have to do this again in this video. Okay, I think, I think that's a decent choice of template and search window. Let's see if the computer can do it. Yay. All right, I got lucky because if it gets snagged, it's on that meter stick. Now, there's some cool features we can use here. First of all, these uh, diamonds are a little cumbersome, or a little uh, obtrusive, I should say. So 
I can right click on one of those markers and I think they're called footprints. Let's change it to just a spot. Okay. I don't care about the numbers. Let's get rid of that. So this is a lot like, or this really is, one of those motion diagrams show keyframe. Let's get rid of that. This is just like one of those motion diagrams from the first chapter of your book. Now, we've talked about the fact that the displacement vector from one point to the next basically is the velocity vector. All you have to do is take displacement and scale it by delta t, or 1 over delta t, and you have turned your displacement vector into a velocity vector. And that's what Tracker does. Up here I've got the option to display velocity vectors. So let me do that. You know what, first can I change the color of these points? If I right click, color, yes. Let's go with white. Okay, and now I'll show the velocity vectors. I don't want the velocity vectors to be white. Usually in our book, they're blue. So I go down here, I right clicked on one of the vectors. I went down to velocities, color, let's make those blue. Doesn't that happen in uh, Cinderella, one of the great Disney classics? Blue, pink, blue, I like that scene. <clears throat> um, great, all right, so we can see just by looking at the lengths of the velocity vectors that the ping pong ball is speeding up. I can't really tell so much, aha, you know why? Because the, um, the computer is only showing the last, you know, fraction of a second. If we go up here, set trail length, show me all steps. Okay, now we can see that on the way up, the velocity vector was getting shorter, and on the way down, it's getting longer. Let's also show the acceleration vector. And which way do we expect it to point? If the analysis of the previous slides is correct, we expect the acceleration to only have a vertical component. If you could ignore air drag and all other forces except for gravity, excuse me, the acceleration should point straight down, moment of truth. Oh, those vectors are just little nubs. We can't even see the direction that they point. So right here, there's a, a length adjustment. Before I do that, let's change the color. So again, I'll right click on these vectors, go down to accelerations this time, choose the color to be red. That's the customary choice for your book. And now let's make those vectors longer. Specifically, I want the accelerations to be longer. And this seems to be a good setting. Ha ha! So that's pretty satisfying, right? The computer doesn't know anything about um, our kinematic equations. It's, it's not forcing the picture here to match the equations. It's literally just um, logging the coordinates of the points and from those from that data it's taking the difference, dividing by time, and it's coming up with these vectors here. So it looks like the acceleration really is straight down. Now I do see a little bit of tilt. That could be a, an artifact of you know numerical error like rounding errors or it could be the fact that a ping pong ball is not particularly dense. It does experience some air drag Although I would expect, if anything, I would expect the acceleration to tilt to the left because the air drag on the ball would be backwards. I don't know, maybe there's some lift there. We'll talk a little bit about lift in this chapter. The other thing I'd like to confirm while we're here in Tracker is the fact that the horizontal velocity is constant. And look at that, it's, it's staring us in the face here because the default graph is x coordinate versus time. How do you see velocity? How do you see x velocity? in an x versus t graph, you merely look at the slope. And it seems to me that the slope is indeed constant. Now, I could also do this. I could change this x to vx, which is the x coordinate of velocity. And you know what, I should have, uh, should have rehearsed this because this, this looks terrible actually. See how it's, it's changing wildly? That's because it doesn't know what the, the sense of scale is. You know what, let me try that real quick. I can add a calibration stick. What are the instructions here? Shift click to mark, okay. So shift, I'll click on the top here, click on the bottom, and that's gotta be roughly one meter. Ah, they're saying 424. I wonder if the, the, the graph was so misleading. So 1.0 meters, now I can hide that. And it, it, it has immediately updated the numbers. That's pretty cool, right? There's just some math going on behind the scenes and computer, computers do math real quick. And you can see how the, the x velocity 
actually does seem to be increasing a little bit, but only from 1.6 to 1.7. And it really shouldn't be changing even that much. And why is it increasing? Why would the x velocity increase? So let me go back. Do I need to rotate this? Aha, do you see there's a little bit of tilt? Like the, uh, the axis lines up with the stick at the top, but it, they're a little, they are a little misaligned at the bottom. So if I fix this just a little bit, that might improve my results. That seems to have made it worse. Okay, I'm not going to dwell on this anymore. But you get the idea. The x component of the velocity is roughly constant. On the other hand, if we plot y versus t, we get that nice quadratic equation, right? y equals y naught plus v naught y t minus one half gt squared. There it is. There's the graph of the y dependence on time. If I look at the y velocity versus time, v sub y, that's, that's very nice. That's what I was hoping for. Do you see how steady the slope is? What do you think that slope is? Now, I don't know what the frame rate of this video actually is. Hopefully, since it's native to Tracker, Tracker chose the appropriate frame rate of yeah, 30 frames per second. So if that's all correct, and you noticed I was pretty sloppy with my, um, my choice of the calibration stick, but roughly it was one meter. I can now go up to Analyze, right-click, Analyze. Let me uh, grab some points here. Analyze again, curve fit. Let me ask for a linear fit. Okay, the slope of velocity versus time over here is 9.43. And the only reason it's not closer to 9.8 is because I didn't choose my one meter very carefully. Okay, but I think we've confirmed the facts mentioned in the slides. Now, this discussion gets at the heart of a hot topic from the 16th century and earlier. This is something people were discussing in Galileo's time. I think by the time Newton showed up on the scene, there was some pretty solid understanding of the answer to this question. But people may have wondered about this going all the way back to ancient times. Remember the, the old debate about, does the earth go around the sun or does the sun and everything else revolve around Kanye West. I mean, I'm sorry, around uh, planet Earth. One of the reasons people had trouble accepting the so-called heliocentric, or, or uh, that means sun-centered, or Coper Copernican view, which is, yeah, that the, uh, the Earth goes around the sun, was if the Earth is in fact making a giant circuit around the sun, even though uh, people back in Greek times and even in the 16th century didn't know exactly how far the sun was from the earth. They probably had some vague notion. And they realized that the earth would have to be moving really fast to make a, a circuit that big in one year. So if that's the case, if we're really flying through space on this, this globe, then how come, if you're this caveman here, how come when you throw a rock straight up in the air, why doesn't it just fly right past your shoulder immediately? Right, if you're, if you're on the earth, and you throw this rock upwards, now the, the rock is no longer connected to you, <clears throat> how come that rock doesn't just keep going upwards while you move to the right in this fashion? See that? Let me go back and do that again since I put some work into those slides here. So you throw the rock upwards, you continue moving to the right, the rock continues moving straight up. If that were the case, then from Mr. Caveman's perspective, wouldn't the rock appear to be flying backwards? And we all know that doesn't happen. <clears throat> if you're out on the, the playground or the baseball field, playground, what am I, stuck in elementary school? And you, you uh, toss a baseball up from your hand. It doesn't immediately fly backwards at 30 kilometers per second, which, by the way, is how fast planet Earth is moving through space. Uh, it just goes straight up and comes back down to your hand. So what's up with that? Maybe you've never thought about this before, but it is an interesting topic. Before you've taken physics, before you've talked about um, reference frames and Galilean relativity, which, which is basically presented in these chapters, um, why doesn't the ball appear to be moving backwards from your hand? Some postulated that uh, perhaps it has something to do with the atmosphere. And uh, so the air around planet Earth, which we call the atmosphere, is, is kind of dragging the rock along with it. And that's why it seems to stay with your hand. It's the same question 
when you're on an airplane, if you're on a jet at high altitude and you're, you're flying at four to 500 miles per hour, if, you, uh, if you've got a tennis ball in your hand and you, and you toss it up, how come it doesn't immediately fly past your shoulder? Or if you're pouring a, a soda can or pouring the soda from a can into a styrofoam cup, how come the soda doesn't fly past and get all over your, your shirt? It's exactly this idea. Think of, mm, think of the shadows as like planet Earth just chugging along at that constant speed, 30 kilometers per second. And when you, when you throw the baseball up or the rock straight upwards, yes, you gave the rock a vertical component of velocity, but the rock already had a horizontal component of velocity because it was moving with you on the Earth. And there's no reason that that X component of velocity should suddenly disappear as seen by somebody in outer space. So the rock will continue to move the same distance horizontally each unit of time while it moves upwards. <clears throat> so the, the actual motion will look something more like this. Let me do that again. So yes, the rock is rising as the Earth moves forward, but the rock continues to move forward. Why? Because there's no acceleration for the rock in this direction. There's nothing pushing or pulling against that rock, so it should continue to move at the same speed it was before horizontally. But its vertical uh, velocity is changing because of the pull of gravity. Let's make our kinematic equations work a little bit harder now. This formula that I'm going to derive, if you want to call it that, I call it the range formula. Your book doesn't call it that, so don't get it too attached to that name, but it's a name that we can use for shorthand, or as shorthand in this class. Let's consider something like a cannon, launching a cannonball, and this is decidedly not a parabola, but we will show shortly, not in this presentation, but in a future presentation, that the cannonball, if you can neglect air drag, it does in fact move along a parabola. Here are some fun graphics from the Hewitt book that I told you about, Conceptual Physics. That's probably a book that got a whole generation of, uh, well, not necessarily physicists into the subject, but many people use this book in college classes for many years. If you were to just uh, let a cannonball drop out of the cannon without being launched, it would fall straight down, and let's just suppose that we're, we're using a strobe light or camera to take pictures at equal time intervals. And you can see how the cannonball falls greater distances um, for each successive time interval because it's speeding up. Now, if you didn't have gravity, see the gravity-free path here? If you were on a planet that had no gravity, that's silly, but if you could shut off the gravity and launch something straight out, then the motion would appear like this. Notice how the ball travels equal distances in equal times. Well, the actual trajectory of something launched horizontally in a gravitational field is in a sense a combination of those two. It's doing both of those things simultaneously. So if you look at the vertical coordinate at each moment in time, see how the ball at this moment in time is at the same height as the ball dropped straight down a moment later, uh, the ball that was launched in gravity is at the same height as the ball that was dropped straight down. So the vertical motion is identical to something dropped straight down, and the horizon horizontal motion is identical to something fired forward in a gravitational, excuse me, in a gravity-free region. So that's a really nice graphic. It, it uh, helps illustrate the fact that the motion along the two axes are, it, it's independent independent motion along the two axes. And that is only true because those two axes are perpendicular. The x-axis is perpendicular to the y-axis. And that is why it's possible to have, to completely separate the motion in that way. Now this is a little harder to conceptualize, but if you launched something at an angle rather than straight forward, if there were no gravity, they would just keep on going in that direction but the influence of gravity causes this, disflect, uh, this uh, displacement away from the straight line path. You'll notice, again, the x-coordinates are the same in each case. How about I call these times time one, time two, time three, etc. At time two, the ball that is uh, launched in a gravitational field has the same x-coordinate as the ball launched in a gravity-free uh, gravity region. And that's also true for time three, time four, 
So it's, it's only the vertical component of the motion that is affected by gravity. That's provided uh, your coordinate system is chosen so that the y-axis lines up with gravity. All right, spend some time staring at these pictures until it sinks in. Okay, what are we doing here? You'll notice uh, this does look more like a parabola, and it's symmetric about this center line here. Now, we could show that easily with our kinematic equations, but I will ask you to just accept that for the time being, that this uh, symmetric trajectory, or this parabolic trajectory, is symmetric about the center. And I'm interested in finding an expression for the range of this projectile. How far does it travel before striking the ground again? So, the stipulation here is that the, the ball begins and ends at the same y-coordinate. The formula that I'm working towards requires that to be true. It must begin and end at the same height. Now, realistically, the, the mouth of the cannon is going to be at least a foot or two off the ground, and yet it lands on the ground. Just forget about that. Just imagine that it's beginning and ending at the same height to keep this simple. And let's define some times here. The, the three relevant times would be the time of launch, which I'm calling T naught. Let's just set that equal to zero seconds. So that's when we start the stopwatch. T1 is when it reaches the apex. That's the highest point here. And then T2 will be when the cannonball strikes the ground. Now T2, as measured from zero, is really how long the cannonball spends in the air. So you could call that the time of flight. T2 is how long the ball spends in the air before it strikes the ground. And if you think about it, if the motion really is symmetric about the center line, then the amount of time it takes to go all the way should be double the amount of time it takes to get to the apex. In other words, T2 has to be two times T1. Again, we could show that with our kinematics, but I think it's fairly intuitive. And now, now let's um, resolve the velocity vector into components at some arbitrary point along the trajectory. I could have placed the ball anywhere on the trajectory. Notice I made the velocity vector tangent to the trajectory, and I've labeled the components with subscripts. What just happened there? As we watch uh, the ball make its way along the trajectory, watch what happens to V sub X. Any change? There shouldn't be. I tried to draw it so that there was no change. However, the Y component of the velocity, watch how it changes. It decreased. So it's a, notice it's a positive component. Now it's a less positive component. When the ball reaches the apex, that vertical component has decreased to zero. So it started out positive, then less positive, then zero. It's decreasing because the acceleration is negative, right? The, the Y acceleration is negative if we call up positive. Up positive means that any, any acceleration directed down is a negative acceleration. Uh, but again, you'll notice no change in the x component. So this length here is the same as this vector. And now, it, uh, instead of calling it merely v sub x, it really is the, the total. Uh, it's, it's like the hypotenuse of a triangle that's been shut down to zero or collapsed to zero. Right? You see, if, if you collapse this side, the x component becomes identical with the hypotenuse. OK? And that really means that the, the cannonball has its lowest speed at this point. Because in general, speed is the length of the velocity vector. You would have to use the Pythagorean theorem, plug in these two components, you know, square them, add them up, take the square root <clears throat> to get the length of the hypotenuse. Only at the top does the y component go to zero. So that's when the, uh, the result that comes out of the Pythagorean theorem would be at its lowest value. Okay. We can use that observation to make some progress here. We know that at the, at the apex, for a moment, the y component of the velocity is zero, just for a moment. <clears throat> so I've made that observation up here. And now let's use this familiar kinematic equation. Again, it's only applicable if your acceleration is constant. It tells you that the change in velocity between any two times is just the rate of change of velocity, acceleration, times the time interval. And that's, that's probably the best way to write it succinctly for any time interval. Let's now apply this to a specific time interval between launch and apex. That's between times T0 and T1. 
see how I've uh, adapted this equation to be consistent with the notation for this problem. So velocity at time one in the y direction minus velocity at time zero in the y direction. And that's why the delta t is time one minus time zero. I was careful to include the minus sign in front of g because we know that the acceleration is negative. See how I've chosen my positive y direction to be up. Now, can we simplify this? Well, we just decided that at the top, or at the apex, the y component for a moment is zero. At that time, t1, the y component is zero, so I'll plug in a zero there. And we set, the, uh, we set up our time scale, or time axis, so that the initial time, t0, is zero. Now, what am I doing here? Right, so I'm referring to the y component of the initial velocity vector. This helps you visualize that. So I've drawn the initial velocity vector. It, it emanates from the origin. It's tangent to the trajectory at that point. That's the point where the ball enters free fall because it's now left the cannon. And the, the y component of that vector is this component right here. So v naught y means the y component of the velocity vector at time zero. Make those substitutions that I just mentioned, and you'll notice that these minus signs cancel. If you solve for t1, you get this expression. So this is a, an algebraic simple expression for the time at which this uh, cannonball reaches its apex based on its initial y velocity. And this is actually rather intuitive. Let me give you a simple example. Instead of a parabolic trajectory, suppose you just threw a baseball straight up into the air, straight up into the air. You know that on the way up, it's going to slow down at about 10 meters per second every second. 10 meters per second every second. So if you threw it up at 30 meters per second, which is kind of impossible because that's almost 70 miles an hour, but if you threw it straight up at 30 meters per second, how long will it take to get to the top? Well, it starts out at 30 meters per second, and it's slowing down by 10 meters per second every second. So it goes from 30 to 20 to 10 to 0. It does that in a time of 3 seconds. So all you really did in your head was you divided 10 meters per second squared into the initial velocity of 30 meters per second. So you almost, it's almost a common sense result. Now, it's less obvious if I said something like some, you know, you launch a BB from a BB gun upwards at 86.3 meters per second on a planet where the gravitational acceleration is 7.65, then it doesn't immediately occur to you that you would use division. But when you pick those nice easy numbers, for whatever reasons, our, our brains are able to recognize that we should do a division. Okay. Well, we've already established that the time of flight is just double the time to apex, so let's just double this expression, and I get this for the time of flight. This is how long the cannonball is in the air before it strikes the ground. Let's look at what it says. Uh, the weaker the gravity field, right, the smaller the denominator, the greater the time is. Doesn't that make sense? If you went to a small asteroid with an extremely weak gravitational field and you launched this cannonball, you would expect it to be in, in the, quote, air. There's no atmosphere around an asteroid, but you would expect it to be in the air for quite a while before it came back down to the asteroid. So that makes sense. Also, the faster you launch it upwards, the greater uh, the time that it's in the air. So it's a sensible result. And now let's finish this. We were trying to figure out how far the cannonball goes. So... Here's a major theme in these two-dimensional problems. Um, many of the problems that you do in Chapter 4 involving free fall require you to do the following. Use, use one axis to first figure out how long your projectile is in the air. Then you go to the other axis to find some other piece of information. So you, often it's fruitful to ask yourself, okay, which axis determines the time of flight? In this instance, uh, you know, what forces the ball to stop when it hits the ground? And that's really the vertical motion. So it's, it's the vertical part of the motion that, that determines how long the ball is in the air. That's why you might want to write the y equation, as I've done, or, or write some equation along the y-axis first to figure out how long it's in the air. Once you know how long it's in the air, you can go to the other axis, which we're about to do. Now, if there, in, instead of uh, being an unobstructed path here, what if there was like a mountain or a building so that the cannonball struck a building before it reached the ground. 
then it would actually be the horizontal motion that would determine how long the ball was in the air. And you might want to first write that equation. That's just a, a general tip here. Okay, so in order to figure out how far, well, isn't that a displacement along the x-axis? So perhaps we should use this equation that gives displacement along the x-axis. And now you see some of the payoff with that long-winded discussion about the components of gravity in you know, the x and y direction. Because of our choice of axis, see how the x-axis here is perpendicular to gravity. Gravity is up and down, x-axis is left to right. This term is zero. There is no component of gravity along the x-axis. Now, if we wanted to account for air drag, there would be an acceleration along the x-axis and things would be more complicated. But for now, let's get rid of that term. Remember that displacement means final position minus initial position. And since I'd like to know how far the ball went over its entire trajectory, I need to find the position at time two, right? That's when the cannonball hits the ground. Position at time two minus position at time zero. So I'm looking at the displacement over that time interval. And now let's make some substitutions. I could recognize that, hey, the, uh, the initial X coordinate is actually zero because that's where the origin is. Or I could just say the displacement is R units to the right because I'm using the letter R for that overall displacement. So the displacement is positive R and remember that T zero by definition is zero seconds. Make those substitutions and you get this very simple result. So all we have to do is take the horizontal velocity now, the component of velocity in the X direction which does not change. Multiply that by how long the ball is in the air, and we will have our expression for how far the ball went. Totally intuitive. So make that substitution, and you'll wind up with this equation. If you happen to know the strength of the, the G field on your planet, wherever you happen to be, and you know the initial velocity vector components, it's a simple matter to plug those numbers in and find how far that projectile will go. And here's where we can use our trigonometry again. If we go back to the, uh, the V-naught triangle, as I'll call it, you can make a triangle out of the initial velocity vector. So we've got the, the components of that vector. <clears throat> Notice that V-naught x is the adjacent side. That's why I took the hypotenuse and multiplied by the cosine to get the initial x component of velocity. The y component of velocity is the opposite side from this, this angle, so we multiply by the sine. And now we can take these expressions for the initial velocity components, plug them back into our formula. Voila! The substitutions have been made, and this is starting to look a little gnarly. We've got two trig functions in there. We've got a v-naught, we've got a v-naught. Can we simplify this? Well, first of all, v naught times v naught we can write as v naught squared. And now let, re let me remind you about one of those trig identities that you may have been tortured with back in high school pre-calculus. Did I pick a good picture here? I can't tell if this kid is uh, surprised, horrified, or some emotion I've never experienced. In any case, do you remember this? The sine of two times an angle is the same as two times Sine of, the, sine of that angle times the cosine of that angle. I don't have all the trig identities memorized. I do have this one memorized because it shows up fairly often. You know, there's maybe a half dozen, at the most, identities that are worth memorizing for these classes because you'll see them often. And I do see two sine theta cos theta. So let's take that two sine theta cos theta and just rewrite that as sine of two theta. Write the v-naught times v-naught as v-naught squared. And there we are. There's a nice compact formula for the range of a projectile in a uniform gravity field neglecting air drag. V naught squared sine 2 theta over g. And just like we did a moment ago, let's see if the role of each quantity is sensible. You know, g is in the denominator, v naught squared is up top, sine is in the top. Let's see if those all make sense. And I want to emphasize, you can only use this formula if your object begins and ends at the same height. So, should you memorize this? Eh, you know, if you're good at memorizing things, go ahead, throw it on your note card by all means. 
But this is not going to help you with every single problem. This is a specific result. What's much more important is to understand the steps that led me to this formula. Because you will definitely have problems that aren't this exact, they don't have this exact uh, geometry here. <clears throat> okay, first let's take note of the fact that according to this formula, the range of your projectile is inversely proportional to G. We read that as an inverse proportionality. What does that mean? Well, here's a graph of um, range versus G strength, strength of the G field. And let's say that um, for a particular gravity field, like the one on Earth, when you launch your object at a given angle and a given speed, notice this, this graph has no dependence on theta or V naught. It's only showing us the relation between range and G. So you launch at a particular speed and a particular angle, you get this range for this uh, strength of gravity field. And please ignore the numbers here for now. Now let's suppose you go to a planet where the gravity is five times as strong. And I don't think there is any such planet in our solar system. You can find planets for sure out there with gravity fields that strong. But suppose you're on a planet where the gravity is five times as strong. You're going to have some real strong bones on that planet. And if you accidentally fell out of bed, you probably won't wake up. That's bad news. You'll notice that because of the shape of this inverse uh, curve here, the, the range dropped down to one-fifth of its initial value. You see that? This height, this height right here, is one-fifth of this height. So for five times the gravity strength, you get one-fifth the range. That's all that means. That's what inverse proportionality means. So if you were on a planet with, with gravity half as strong, as Earth's, well, then you'd go the other way. You'd get two times the range. What else can we say? The range is proportional to the square of the velocity. And this is the part that, that is a little surprising. Before I get to the picture, what does this say? Now let's do the picture first. Okay. Um, you launch, maybe it's a baseball. You throw a baseball at a given speed, v naught, And let's pick a number for definiteness. I think most people can throw a baseball at 20 miles an hour. Right? So you're out on the, the, uh, the field, scrimmaging, whatever, you throw a baseball at a particular angle on Earth at 20 miles per hour. How much farther will that, will that baseball go if you now throw it twice as fast? See how uh, I'm looking at this particular data point. It goes a given distance r for this given speed. Now, if you, th if you throw the ball at twice the speed, I go up and I meet the curve at a much higher point. I forgot to point out, I'm looking at a parabola, right? Why a parabola? Because it's quadratic. We know that a quadratic dependence graphs as a, a parabola. So at twice the speed, look at that. The range jumps up by a factor of four. Whoa. Two times the velocity compared to initial, initially, and yet four times the range. And ask yourself if that seems reasonable. So you and your buddy are on the, uh, the baseball diamond field, whatever, the outfield, you throw a ball at 20 miles an hour. Your buddy throws it at 40 miles an hour. Does it really go four times as far? Because from 20 to 40, you're doubling the speed. Four times as far? Because if you throw a ball at 20, you could probably get it to go halfway across the, the diamond. I don't know, at least a significant portion. Four times as far would put it out of the park. Or let's say you... you um, you hit a baseball off the bat at 50 miles an hour, which is definitely possible, and it gets almost to the, uh, to the edge of the field, and then the next batter hits it at 100 miles an hour. So that's double the speed. Is it going to go four times as far? I mean, that would put it way past the, uh, the bleachers, past even the parking lot probably. I don't think I've ever seen that. It, it doesn't seem consistent with your common sense. Throwing something twice as fast means four times as far. No, 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 no. Something is wrong here, right? Do you remember what's wrong? Well, we'll come back to that in just a second. The last dependence here is on angle. Now, this one's a little non-intuitive as well. Think of the shot put. Did you ever uh, have to do a shot put in track or in high school PE? I remember in junior high, eh, I was a bit of a uh, late bloomer as far as my physical growth. Not that you care, but I, I just remember being the worst in the class for the dumbbell. That was kind of mortifying. I don't know, 20 people there in that, in that PE class. That thing was heavy. <clears throat> um, if, when you go to 
put the shot, as I think you say, do you really shove it at 45 degrees? Throw a shot, put it at 45 degrees. That just seems awkward. That seems like you would injure your shoulder. It's definitely a smaller angle. So uh, the reason for that is you can develop the, the way the, the human body works, the mechanics of your shoulder joint and your, your arm muscles or whatever, you can develop more force at a different angle. So forget about the mechanics of the human body. Let's just suppose that, that you were capable of launching something at the same speed regardless of the angle. So this is really separate from discussing how your, you know, the joints or the shoulder joint of your arm. No, the shoulder joint of your shoulder. <clears throat> when when uh, does this function reach a maximum? Well, we know what sine looks like. It starts from zero. It reaches a maximum value of one, and then it dives back down. Normally, where does this first hump end? It goes to zero at pi radians or 180 degrees, and then it finishes at 360 degrees or two pi radians. But we've got this factor of two out front. So by the time your angle gets to 90, 2 times 90 is 180, and you've already finished that first hump. That's why I've put the zero here at pi over 2, not just pi. Okay, so sine of 2 theta actually finishes its first hump by the time you get to 180 degrees, excuse me, 90 degrees, pi over 2 is 90 degrees, which means it peaks not at 90 as it normally would, but at 45. There it is. You can also just ask, when does sine reach a maximum? Well, 2 theta would have to be 90 degrees. If 2 times theta is 90, then theta is 45. So it peaks at 45 degrees. Cool. Kind of makes sense, right? Here's a plot somebody else prepared of a ball launched at various angles. And you can see that, at, at, by the way, each launch would be done at the same speed. That's important. These are launches at equal speeds, but the angle is what affects the, um, the range here. If you launch it at too small of an angle, it hits the ground before it has time to really get any displacement. Now, if you launch it at a very steep angle, yes, it's going very fast, but it's mostly going upwards, not forwards, so it doesn't cover much ground during the time that it's in the air. So the compromise would be an angle in the middle. Yes, you've got some forward velocity to cover some ground, but you've also got some upward velocity to keep the ball in the air for a while. If you're not in the air for very long, then you're gonna hit the ground soon. That's why that, that 45 degrees is a nice compromise between these two extreme cases of, you know, almost straight up and not going very far and almost straight forward and not going very far. And this all reminds me of a game you've probably never heard of because of uh, you guys were born in what, I think 2011 is when most of you were born, but it was on early Macintosh computers. My, my dad used to teach graphic arts at a high school in Northview, excuse me, Covina, it was called Northview High School. And this was back in the early to mid 80s, mid to late 80s even. And the school uh, would purchase all of the latest Macintosh computers. This is when computers were making rapid development and it's all kind of ancient history now, but there was a game on these Mac computers called Artillery where you could choose your launch angle right here and how much gunpowder to use, which effectively determined the speed. And if only at the age of eight I had known my kinematic equations, I could have, I could have killed my opponent every time by just doing some math on paper, because that's all that's going on behind the scenes, I'm sure, was uh, the use of kinematic equations. So every video game, I'm, I'm thinking, probably has some physics built into it. Can we apply this formula to something familiar, something practical? because it's easy to look up how far a typical home run goes in Major League Baseball. Some of you probably know that number or you're familiar with typical distances. Let's see if we can confirm that with our range formula. So, since we've just shown that for a given speed, 45 degrees will maximize the trajectory, let's assume that this hitter or this batter has just um, launched the baseball off the bat at a speed V-naught, 45 degrees from the horizontal, and SOB here, this is not son of a gun, that's speed off the bat. I looked this up, 103 miles per hour is, is a pretty typical value for baseball speeds right off the bat. It's kind of interesting, you, um, they leave the pitcher's hand at a given speed, I don't know, 80 miles per hour. When they get to the home plate, they're going a little slower because of air drag, and then they leave the bat 
even faster, going at something like 100 miles per hour. Let's convert that into meters per second. And there's something interesting going on here. MPH, remember, that's, that's actually a rate in itself. That's miles over hour, miles per hour. But I'm treating it as a compound unit. So I've got miles per hour in the numerator, miles per hour in the denominator, and I can just cancel miles and hours simultaneously. Okay, so 46 meters per second, that's over 100 miles per hour. Now that we've got all of our quantities in SI units, let's plug them in. We just take that the square of that speed off the bat, multiply by the sine of 2 theta, and I'm going to assume theta is 45. And then since we're on Earth, we're not playing baseball on the moon, let's divide by 9.8. Drum roll, please. 216 meters. Is that reasonable? Well, usually in baseball, we like to measure distances in feet. So let's convert that down here. 216 meters. There's a little over three feet per meter. 712 feet. That sounds kind of far. 700 feet? Is that realistic? Well, I pulled up uh, longest home runs of all time or recent time um, baseball stats. Not something I've ever been into, but I get the appeal. I, if, you're, if you like numbers, I can totally understand. I have a friend who works, uh, he's a manager at a Ralph's. He's been working there for a long time, and he, he just has a lot of numbers in his head. He loves baseball stats. Something very gratifying about it to him. All right, these are like the longest hits ever, and none of them are, are over 500 feet. So there's something wonky about our result. Did we use the formula wrong? Did I plug in the numbers wrong? What's going on? I think you know what's going on. It's because we totally neglected air drag. Obviously, a baseball has to contend with air drag. We're going to see that the faster you go, the greater the drag force. And baseballs are going pretty fast. I mean, just think about the difference between sticking your hand out the window at 20 miles an hour when you're driving and sticking your hand out the window at 80 miles an hour on the freeway. There's a big difference in the air drag on your hand. And now imagine going 100 miles an hour. I hope you're not doing that on the freeway. Uh, there's going to be significant drag, and it has effects on the trajectory. Think about it. Uh, our equations are only accurate to the extent that the acceleration is constant and has a value of 9.8 straight down. But when you encounter air drag, you've got additional forces on the baseball. Those will produce additional acceleration components. That changes the kinematics. So it would be really naive to expect our constant acceleration, free fall kinematics to correctly predict the trajectory of a baseball. But guess what? Uh, later in the semester, we can make a few changes in our analysis. After we've introduced Newton's second law, we can fairly accurately predict the trajectory of a baseball. So that should be pretty satisfying to do a few weeks from now. So a couple things to note here. Look how much farther the so-called vacuum trajectory is. Big difference, almost 200 feet extra. And the blue curve is not even really symmetric. Do you see that? You can't really fold it over the midpoint and have it look the same. Not only that, but the apex is higher. That's a little weird. Why would the, the ball encountering air drag go even higher than the vacuum trajectory? Some of you sports enthusiasts, blah, blah, blah. Some of you sports enthusiasts, I'm sure, are recognizing that has to do with lift. So we'll look briefly at lift and the so-called Magnus effect later in the semester. And we'll try to model that effect in an Excel spreadsheet and correctly reproduce uh, the trajectory of a baseball. Up here, I think they're, they're using R for the ratio of the ranges. So this is um, with air drag compared to no air drag. So an actual baseball hit goes about 70% as far as the, the predicted vacuum trajectory. Can we look at an even more a dramatic example? Oh, first here's some, somebody did some interesting plots here, plus air resistance plus Magnus. So the air resistance is something we look at in the sixth chapter of your book. We look at the quadratic model for air drag. It's pretty simple mathematically. And then there's this more complicated effect called the Magnus effect, which your book does not treat. And we'll look at that real, brief, real briefly in a lab. Huge difference though, right, between the um, vacuum trajectory and 
the actual trajectory with air drag. Okay, let's put ourselves on the moon now. I'm sick of Earth. Here we are on the moon, and for whatever reason, you have an M1 Garand rifle. Those things shoot really far. Was it World War I or two where they used these rifles? I forget, but, but the rounds go real far, and I almost made a, a classic rookie mistake of putting a picture of the the whole shell, like the shell casing and the, uh, yeah, I didn't realize that until recently. The bullet is different from the shell casing. Oops. Here's some numbers. Because if, if we want to use our range formula, we need to know how fast this thing leaves the gun. That's called the muzzle velocity. That sounds pretty intense. 853, wow. Uh, here's a number worth memorizing. The speed of sound is around 343. 340, uh, if, if you round to the nearest tens, 340 meters per second. So this thing is going more than double the speed of sound. So more than Mach 2, I guess you would say. It's going to make a little sonic boom as it goes past you. Well, hopefully it's not going past you. Hopefully you're far away. Okay, so I'm just going to round that to 850, muzzle velocity. And we know that the gravity on the moon is weaker. It's about one-sixth the acceleration here on Earth, so 1.6 meters per second squared. And let's just stick with the easy value for theta. It's 45, so we're, we're maxing out the range as far as the angle is concerned. What do you think? Is this going to go a mile, 10 miles? Just plug in your numbers. Sine of 90 is 1, so that's easy. And I find, whoa, 73,000 meters. Could we uh, express that more compactly? Well, every thousand meters is a kilometer, so we can convert that into kilometers. 74 kilometers, basically. Remember, what is it? Uh, two miles is basically three kilometers. More precisely, uh, divide by 1.6. 46 miles. Okay, so that's greater than the distance from Long Beach to downtown Los Angeles. I think that would take you even past Santa Monica, we're talking about miles, not hours. Hours-wise, I mean, that's what, 10 hours? And there's something a little suspicious about that as well, because, okay, while 46 miles is still really small compared to the diameter of the moon, you can imagine just plugging in bigger and bigger numbers. Instead of shooting a, a bullet out of a rifle, what if you were launching a missile? Or you had a rail gun? So get something going much faster even than that. You would get a number so big, because remember, we're squaring the velocity. It, the range goes up really quickly with velocity. You can imagine if you launch something at 2,000 meters per second, the number out here would be enormous. And at that point, I mean, you're, you're practically leaving your planet or your moon. So something just seems a little fishy about that. How can you be making a parabola over the ground if you've actually like left the ground entirely? And at that point, your trajectory has a curvature similar to the planet itself. What is going on here? I don't know. Well, I do know. You guys don't know. Maybe you do. Okay. This is a more accurate picture of the gravity field. Pick any point above the surface here, here, the surface of the moon. We know that the gravity points straight down, or I should say towards the center. Gravity pulls you towards the center of the planet. And the length here represents the, the strength. So everywhere on this circle, the strength of the gravity should be the same because it's equidistant from the center of the moon and it's directed towards the center. If you go out a little further or farther, you would expect gravity to be weaker. We all kind of know that, right? If you go real far from Earth, you shouldn't feel it's the effect of gravity as much. So I've indicated that by drawing shorter arrows. So Way out here, you're still being pulled towards the center of the moon as you would be pulled here, but you're not being pulled as hard, hence the length of the vector should be shorter. Is this, uh, you know, did we take this into account when we did our analysis? Definitely not. Um, we imagined shooting something straight forward, actually it was at 45 degrees, but if you did shoot something straight forward, uh, you know, would you really expect a parabola that opens downwards? That's what you would expect if this were the gravitational field. So remember, when we set up our kinematic equations and we applied them to free fall, 
we were imagining that, and by the way, yeah, I put every one of these arrows in individually. It was pains, a labor of love. I spent about two days doing this. And this is all for your benefit, so don't think I'm slacking off here. No, I didn't do that. I just copy-pasted. But, um, yeah, we were assuming that at each point along the trajectory, whether you're here, 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 that the y component of acceleration is negative 9.8 and the x acceleration is zero. Making that assumption is equivalent to this uh, picture of a uniform gravitational field. Uniform meaning at every point in space, the g field has the same value. It's 9.8 and it points straight down. We know that doesn't uh, that's not the way it works, right? It's not like there's this uh, platform that extends way out here. It's not like the ground just keeps on going. Unless you're a flat earther, then maybe maybe it does work that way in your mind. But this is obviously not accurate. Now, if you're looking at relatively restricted trajectories, just a little bitty boop, you know, if you were launched from here and you plop down here, yeah, the, the G field doesn't change much from here to there. So for problems taking place over a limited range of motion near the surface of the Earth, it's okay to make that assumption that it's the same direction and 9.8 everywhere. But as soon as you launched, uh, you've launched something far from the surface, so these distances are on the order of the radius, then this picture is ridiculous. You have to go back to this analysis, and you're probably thinking, that's more difficult. Wouldn't that be more difficult? If, if the direction of the gravity vector is changing throughout the trajectory, that means you've got a different a sub x and a different a sub y on one point of the trajectory versus another. So it's like, do you have to use a different kinematic equation for different pieces of the motion? Kind of. You kind of have to do that. In fact, what we're talking about here is uh, using calculus. But guess what? By the end of the semester, you will know how to do that for some simple, for some special problems. And it's not as hard as you think. So we will be looking at that towards the end of the semester. In fact, I'll give you a little sneak preview. Uh, this is first introduced in chapter eight of your book, I believe, but it turns out that the, the actual dependence of the strength of gravity on your distance from the center, so R measures your distance from the center, that's an inverse square dependence. So if you go out farther from the center of the Earth, the strength of G goes down. And that's just a qualitative statement. Uh, you go out farther, it goes down. If you want to be uh, quantitative, you need to know what the actual power law is. R squared means if you go twice as far, you're talking about one-fourth the strength. Two squared is four. And this is just a little cartoon drawing of that one over R squared dependence. If you're curious, this big M is the mass of your planet, or moon in this case. Big G is a, is a special experimental number that captures the, the strength of gravity. And it's something that wasn't measured until the 1800s, but we'll say more about that later.